Good morning. I'm sorry I can't be with you today in person. I often feel that coping with uncertainty is the greatest challenge we face as leaders. And I think we have demonstrated that, but I think we've also coped well. I think I need to warn you that this is the very first video I've ever recorded myself using my computer. But I think if it goes viral, well, I have a new career ahead of me. I've been asked to speak about the larger context for leadership, the larger context in which we're trying to do good work, in which we're trying to transform ourselves and we're trying to work from the inside out. All of this work is even more essential these days. And by the end of my remarks, I will talk about the role that I see for coaches at this time, because I think the work becomes more and more critical but in presenting the larger context, I have to paint a rather despairing picture. Much of what I'm going to speak about is in my new book, which I believe is available there. And this book requires some serious reading. It's not something you can read quickly. Because I was in the question of how did we end up in this world whose dynamics are very negative and distressing that I will speak about in a few minutes? How did we end up in a world that's so different then and so contrary to what we were trying to create? Many of us have been active out in the world working not only on personal transformation, but active in social movements and in causes that feel important to us. So I'm, I was curious, deeply curious, about how did we end up in a world which has transformed itself, but in the absolute opposite direction, filled with negative dynamics, contrary to what we've been working so hard to create. Some of these negative dynamics that seem so common, I'm going to speak about them from my work globally. I feel confident in describing these as global patterns because I see them everywhere. And for leaders today, it is increasingly hard to practice what they already know works. I know of many leaders whose excellent efforts, whose projects that have proven their worth, that have good evidence to support them, that have really changed lives or created new innovations. I see all over the world, I see leaders who have a good success track record. I see them uh, ha losing their programs, losing their funding, and losing their energy and enthusiasm. It's very difficult to keep going when you know you've done good work, you know your project is useful, you have the data and the evidence, and still you either meet with a great disinterest from your senior, senior leaders above you, or you lose your funding. And that is the overall context of leadership that I want to describe in a little more detail now. One of the things I observe, and again, these are global patterns, is that we face increasing problems, increasing crises, and yet the solutions we apply to them create more problems. People now speak rather glibly of unintended consequences. I remember a few years ago when that was a new term and it kind of shocked people into thinking differently. But now we're living in a world of unintended consequences. And part of the reason we have so many unintended consequences is because we're not really dealing with the complexity of problems as they truly are. Instead, we're looking for quick fixes, short-term solutions, no thought for the future. We just want to get the problem off our desktop or off of our minds. And the other thing that is part of this is that we're simply not recognizing the complexity of these problems. You know, every time we go to blame a single leader or a single individual or a single politician, for our problems, we're really engaging in very simplistic thinking. We're engaging in a, a world, or we're putting forward a worldview that seems to say, 
there are simple causes. Well, you know and I know that's simply not true. We live in a world of complex, multiple causes and conditions. And every time we try and solve a problem by just singling out one factor or one individual to blame, uh, what we're really doing is denying the complexity of this world and we're also not solving our problems. And I feel this is a very major issue in the leadership landscape today. Nassim Taleb, the author of The White Swan, The Black Swan, um, one of my favorite commentators because I like his acerbic wit and, and criticism, he said that never in the history of, of humankind have we created so much complexity combined with so much ignorance about its qualities. So this is a great dilemma for leaders. I think we've created organizations that are too big to lead as well as too big to fail. We've created monstrous bureaucracies filled with policies and procedures. I describe these organizations now as morbidly obese bureaucracies. They simply cannot fulfill the mission. They cannot fulfill the purposes for which they were created. We've created these monstrously complex systems and yet we haven't applied new means to manage them. So I think I warned you this was a rather dark perspective, but let me go a little deeper into the darkness with you. Another uh, real dynamic that's out there is a very negative description a very negative set of beliefs about human beings. I see most leaders do not want to understand or maybe they're just too tired and overwhelmed themselves, but we've lost all sight of what it takes to motivate people and instead we're using punishment and rewards. We're using fear to motivate people and you know from your own experience with fear, I'm sure, that this is a very short term in a motivator. We cannot motivate human beings using fear, using punishment, using a sense of loss or even a sense of competition. We are destroying people's capacity. We are destroying people's desire to want to work with us. And we've turned work into a series of reports, measurements, and audits. We have really... Uh, collapsed our, uh, our work efforts into how we measure them, what we report on, and then we have to live through incessant audits, it seems these days, by somebody from the outside. Now, I think it's important to look at what this, where this path comes from, this path of increasing bureaucracy, increasing policies, procedures, measurements, because for me it comes from an absolute distrust of people. So we believe, we don't believe personally, but generally the cultural belief is that if you want people to work, you have to force them to do it. And then when you force them to do it and they withdraw and they become demotivated, then the leadership group says, see, I told you these people don't want to work, so we've got to apply more punishment and more policies, more policing to control their behavior. This profound distrust of what human beings are capable of is, I think, something that you as coaches, people interested in transforming, this is something to address. In my work for the past 20 years in trying to shift the paradigm to appreciate how we could get order without control, how we could work from a living systems perspective, I've always felt that I could quickly discern whether a leader was willing to go down this path, this new path, this new way of acting and, and seeing and believing, whether they were going to go down that path was quickly revealed to me by what they thought about the people who worked for them. If there was distrust, if there were comments about a loss of work values, if there were just any kind of disparaging comment, I knew that that leader would not be open to change. So what we believe about each other and our capacities for me is the great distinguisher between those who 
uh, will want to work in ways that, that support human nature and human capability or those who will just continue to police us to death. So that's another big trend. And then the other dynamic I have to add into this very dark picture is time and distraction. We no longer have time. We have lots and lots of tasks. We have multiple things we have to do in any given hour. And one of the things that's been disappearing from view in organizations during this increasing uh, turbocharged environment is we've lost the ability to think together. Therefore, we've lost the ability to be effective teams together. We've lost the ability to take time for reflection. And without reflection, you don't actually see the dots, let alone connect them. You can't see the big picture, and you can't make moral judgments. Now, there's one thing about the human brain under stress that I want to bring in here. When we're under stress and we're working in these fear-based environments, we lose up to 95% of our mental capacities. We lose everything that's good about human capacity. We lose the ability to reason. We lose the ability to see the big picture. We lose the ability to make judgments. We lose the ability to contemplate questions of ethics. So all the things that are most essential to human beings that we have spent millennia uh, developing, deep inquiry, uh, reflection, uh, morality, uh, the scientific method, learning from experience, all these things have seemingly disappeared in most organizations. And because I see this as so common, I'm actually saying now that I think we are devolving as a species. I mean, if you look at the behaviors we're good at now, they're just flitting from task to task, not going into the depths of thinking or making reasonable decisions or thinking long term. We, because we are losing capacities, we spent thousands of years developing. That's why I make the statement. I know it's provocative. I'm deliberately trying to provoke us to notice that we are devolving when we don't elicit and use these capacities that are the fundamental gifts of being human and that our ancestors spent a lot of time developing. So the lack of time and the highly distracted nature of our lives right now um, is a serious, it's a, probably the third big dynamic that I've spoken about, because what it does is it, it, it makes us into uh, less than human beings just trying to get through our day-to-day -day work. So the first thing that we need to restore to the workplace is time to think. I'm saying to lots of people, whoever will listen to me these days, I'm saying that given these very negative dynamics, I haven't even talked about polarization, increasing conflict, increasing aggression. Uh, there are many other dynamics that are driving us apart from each other. We're living in a time of increased judgments, instant criticism, which for me is everywhere on the web with this little symbol. We're always asked to give our opinions, we're asked to give our judgments, and one of the very dangerous things that has happened in this culture of instant opinions and criticism is that science is now confused with opinions. And uh, we have to restore our both appreciation of the scientific method, and we also have to restore our ability to think well to conduct experiments, and then to learn from the data that comes in. But all of this is just disappearing. And uh, therefore, I think restoring time to think is the most critical thing we can do. Now, if you're coaching someone personally, you're doing this. I think that's the great gift of coaching at this time, is that it requires reflection. It requires stopping the action, settling down, and thinking about things. That's a rare gift we give each other.
The second thing about time to think is it restores our mental capacity. So we come up the evolutionary scale rather quickly when we just settle down to think. If we're thinking with colleagues, it also restores teamwork and it restores our desire and our interest in being in good relationships. We get out of the frantic uh, instantaneous communication, which is so distressing to more and more people, the text messaging and the, the instant responses that are required. We're really working with such a superficial capacity at this time. But when we take time to think about current work dilemmas in groups with colleagues, we're learning to think together, which means our teamwork improves, our trust of each other improves, our forgiveness and our judgments, all of those things uh, become, you know, our judgments decrease, our forgiveness and understanding of each other increases. And we realize the great pleasure of thinking together with colleagues. And, and finally, we become more intelligent. We start to understand complexity. We understand complex causes and conditions rather than looking for single causes that only create more problems when we implement superficial, uh, simplistic solutions. So this is where I see there is a great role for coaches, but it's already there in that you're already creating time to think and doing the inner work of personal transformation. The last part of what I want to uh, speak about is actually a question that I've been in for several years now. It's given all these dynamics, given the extreme aggression in the world, the negativity, the fear, the criticism, the judgments, the blame, given the fact that political decisions uh, destroy good programs, given the fact that we're not using evidence even though we say we want evidence-based decision-making. I had a, a school administrator say, you know, it's much more decision-based evidence-making, and I think that's a very accurate statement. Given this world that has emerged, the question that I'm posing for you and for myself is who do we choose to be for this time? And I've, in my new book, I've uh, given a title to that, that we could be warriors for the human spirit. We could be the people who do trust other people, who trust in human capacity, who know that most people are capable of much more, of giving much more, of being leaders, if they're in the right circumstance, if they connect. For me, it's always, if I connect uh, to an issue, if I see something that needs to be changed and I step forward, then I am a leader. Worked for a long time with the definition that a leader is anyone willing to help, anyone willing to step forward when they see something that just isn't right to them. So, as warriors for the human spirit, and I use the word warrior in a non aggressive context, I use it from the Tibetan, which is the word for one who is brave. And it's one who is brave enough not to resort to aggression and fear as tactics to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. So I'm putting out this invitation. Could we step forward understanding that as warriors for the human spirit, as people who are brave enough to believe in human goodness, human capacity, and who are brave enough to struggle not to use aggression and not to be taken down by fear and exhaustion, as most people are these days. If we can be those people, then we will be the ones who are brave enough to create change where we are. This is another big departure from my earlier work. I am no longer interested in changing systems because I don't think it's possible. And you'll have to read my book in order to see the depth of that argument. But what I do think is possible, what I think is essential for this time, is that we choose to stand in opposition to, 
counter the current cultural dynamics of distraction, of fear, of anxiety, of exhaustion, and that we be the people who, wherever we are, working with whomever we're with, with the resources we already have, that we're the people who create islands of sanity, where we use the values that we cherish, we use the practices of participation and engagement and the qualities of leadership that we know motivate other people. It's as far from command and control as we could get these days. Uh, we are the people who are brave enough to create difference, to create workplaces, teams, families, maybe our whole community, but we really set ourselves in contrast to these very negative dynamics that are destroying human capacity, destroying relationships, and destroying our ability to uh, think our way out of the very complex problems that we're facing. So in these islands of sanity, led by people who do see themselves as different, uh, for me, this is the real challenge of this time. So can we be warriors for the human spirit? Can we understand that as coaches interested in personal transformation, the first transformation is about our identity? This is a, a critical shift. So we go from being people who need approval, people who want to be liked, people who want to be successful in the terms of the world, we actually disown that. We give that up. I'm, I'm feeling more and more, because I read enough history, that as uh, Rudolf Barrow said, he was a great German green activist, he said, uh, when the old system is dying, when an old culture is dying, the new culture is born from a few people who are not afraid to be insecure. And this is what I'm inviting us into at this point. We're interested already in the work of transformation. And I'm suggesting that the real transformation is first in our identity. So we go from thinking of ourselves as coaches interested in transformation or consultants or whatever the normal leaders, uh, effective leaders, we go, we let that be. Those are still good identities, but there's a much deeper one that I think we're going to need if we are going to not be taken down by these very negative dynamics. I mean, it, it'd be important for you to notice in your own life right now how these dynamics are showing up. So what's your level of exhaustion? Or how often do you feel anxious and stressed? What's happening to your relationships? Because when we're, we have no time for each other, that's the first thing that suffers is relationships at, at work, but also with family and with friends. How much time do you have available now to do the things that you know restore you, that nourish you? How often do you feel peaceful? Uh, how often do you take time for reflect? These are very important questions for all of us if we're committed to not being uh, taken down or exhausted by these very negative dynamics. Now, I foresee the possibility that as warriors for the human spirit, we really become brave people and we really understand that our work is to support others who are suffering greatly during this time, who are exhausted, who are anxious. The, the feeling of collapse, I was just talking to Peter Senge about this two weeks ago at a conference we were both at. He said, everyone's talking about collapse. It's just in the human psyche right now. Well, I don't want to focus on collapse. I want to focus on being the best humans we can be no matter the external circumstances. I want to be in healthy relationships with the people I care for. I want to be in healthy relationships with the people I work with. <clears throat> I want to use the values that I cherish because at the end of my life, I know that's what I'm going to judge myself on. I want to be generous. I want to be compassionate. I want to be forgiving. I don't want to be, you know, taken out by fear, 
competition or a sense of unending dissatisfaction that leads me to grasp for more and more material things. These are my own values. I'm very clear about what they are. So can we be the people who, no matter what's happening in the world, we stand up against that and recreate places? And I love this term, Islands of Sanity. We recreate places where people can think and work well together, where there are levels of trust, where the leader knows how to create high engagement and therefore motivate people. So I think this is the work going forward for coaches. And I offer this invitation to you, uh, realizing that it's difficult and yet at the same time that it's extremely rewarding work. And now I'll look forward to your questions. Thank you very much.